Okay, so those problems are some practice problems um, going over a lot of naming, some moving arrows, and some easy stuff. Um, if I get a chance, I'll maybe go back through and see if there's some other things. I will put, if there isn't already, in the early folders, there's some alkane naming and there's some cycloalkane naming problems that are in the folder listed, you know, prop practice problems. And I think I have some, I think I have some more for easy. And that's probably, that's probably it for the ones that I have before. That's the reason why there's no practice problems in the folders is because there's no practice problems. I've, we haven't done, I haven't done this in, I haven't done full-blown naming in the beginning of the semester ever. So I don't have a, a database of problems. As we get closer to other, as we get closer to the more traditional stuff where we start, I'll have more. So I'll post an answer key for this. I'll go through and narrate it as well. So that way you can go to the problem and then you can hear me walk through it. It takes the same amount of time whether I draw it or whether I draw it and talk. So um, that'll be available over the weekend. Probably not today, but tomorrow or Sunday. All right. Um, any questions about any stuff? So the in class in reading problems are due by midnight tonight, since we finished up chapter two last time. And then the homework problems are due Monday at midnight. Well, eleven fifty nine. So the one, the in, the in the chapter problems are due at midnight, and I'll just keep. And that's the way I'll do it. When I put up chapter three, I I had to go back last night real quick and put the um, hints. Get you get look at the correct answer and the two attempts. So I've got to remember to do that when I when I release a chapter. So any questions about no questions? In two, oh, in yeah. chapter two, okay. Chapter two. Okay, esters. Naming esters. Let me open it up full screen. Okay, 2.32. So how do we name esters? Well, esters are a little bit different. I mean, they're all a little bit different in terms of the way, in terms of the nuance of how you name them. So what we have to know about an ester is this. An ester is traditionally made by taking a carboxylic acid, adding to it an alcohol, and that will make, and I'm going to use, I'm going to use an R prime or an R1 to indicate that those two alkyl groups don't have to be the same, and you get H2O. So this is a reaction later on we'll call Fischer esterification reaction and it kind of looks well it looks a little bit like what we did in lab this week when we made the triboluminescent crystals in the microwave by taking the NH group and reacting it with the anhydride and then ending up with an amide. So that's in the same vein of reaction. But because we traditionally make an ester 
from an acid and an alcohol, we can kind of think of this part coming from the carboxylic acid and this part coming from the alcohol. And so that's the way that esters are named. They're named first based on their alcohol part and then they're based on their carboxylic acid part. And it's the groups that are attached to the oxygen, to the alcohol, that, that alkyl group, and then the R group, including the C double bond O, is how we name the carboxylic acid. So for instance, if I had something that you may come in contact with like every day, This, this is made from ethanol and acetic acid. And so this, this would be called um, the alcohol part first. What alkyl group is attached to the oxygen? It's ethyl. And then what kind of carboxylic acid did it come from? It came from acetic acid, but we changed the suffix to be an ATE. So the, com so the common IUPAC name of this, uh, more, more common name than IUPAC, is ethyl acetate. So that means it's ethanol plus acetic acid. Now when we get to the IUPAC names of the alcohols, they are ANOIC. So this would actually be ethanol ethanoic acid is what we were making it from and then we changed the suffix to be ethanoate so actually the, the true IUPAC name of this would be ethyl ethanoate because it comes from the two carbon carboxylic acid so the ANOATE is the suffix for the ether, like for asters. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, no. No, what's not making sense? Okay, so this is this is its common name. This is its common name. This is its IUPAC name. So, really, we should be naming it this one. So what we're so when we look at an ester, we first of all have to name the alkyl group that's attached to the oxygen. That's the first step. That's the first part of the name. And then we name the carboxylic acid part, only instead of it being, well, then its suffix is A-N-O-A-T-E. So let's go back to the problem. Well, here, here's another one. What would be the IUPAC name of that ester? What's the first what's the first part that I have to name? I have to name the alkyl group that's attached to the oxygen. So what group is that? That's an isopropyl group. So this is going to be isopropyl. Then 
this part is the carboxylic acid part. How many carbons are in the chain? Four. All right, there's four carbons in the chain. So that would be a butan O8. So it's coming from butan O8, butan, sorry, it's coming from butanoic acid. And we're changing the suffix because it's now it's an ester, so it's butanoate. So the same thing, four carbons, ester suffix. So those are the two steps that we have to do to name the ester. Name the alkyl, alkyl, the alcohol portion, and then name the carboxylic acid portion. A little bit clear. You still you still have to know how to name your common name functional group or your common name alkyl groups. If you don't know how to do that, naming's gonna be rough. So there's there's two things you need there's two things that if you don't know right now if you don't know your alkyl groups like what a sec butyl group is, or a terch butyl, or a terch pentyl group. If you can't draw those or recognize those, you need to be able to do that. The second thing is you need to be able to know what functional groups you're looking at. Um, because without those two things, the chart that the chart's meaningless. So you've got to know those two things in order to have a fighting chance of getting the name. So let's go back to the problem. So the problem is this ester. So let's let me transfer it over. So I think it's the other one. Here's the molecule from the book. Just in case somebody says you wrote it upside down, I can't see it upside down. There it is. So we've got to name this out uh, that alkyl group of that alcohol. So what is that? There is a carbon chain with uh, isopropyl? No. There's, there is a four carbon chain, but it's got two methyls on it. But this, this is a common name. So if it didn't have a common name, you could name this, um, well, actually, there's a one, two, three carbon chain. So you could name this one, one dimethyl propyl if it didn't have a common name. But this does have a common name. I'm missing a carbon on the bottom. Where? Here? Here? Oh, like that? There is no isopropyl. So it goes one, two, and then the two. So it goes one, two, then the two, then I'm missing one in front of the oxygen. Yeah. 
Okay, so there is a four carbon chain. So does that one have a common name? No. That doesn't have a common name. The alkyl group that I wrote before, this does have a common name. This one, let's just put the CH2s, the C, the CH3, this is a CH, a CH2 and a CH3. There's no common name for that, for that alkyl group. So that means I'm going to use the IUPAC rules for that. Okay. So what are my IUPAC rules for naming alkyl groups? First step. First step. That's second. That's going to be the second step. The first step for an alkyl group is the numbering starts at what point? Where it's attached. So my first step is this is number one. Now going from number one, what's the longest continuous carbon chain? Because number one has to be the end of that. So now we've got. Now we do have your four carbon chain. So that's going to make this alkyl group a butyl group, right? And my numbering scheme is going to go right down the line. Okay, so number one, attachment point is carbon number one. Find the longest continuous chain starting at that point. Then, what is, what are the substituents? This has how many methyls? Two at carbon, two. So this is going to be a two, two, dimethyl butyl. Right. And you could put this in parentheses if you if you would like. That is now the alcohol portion of that molecule. So it's two two dimethyl butyl. I'm curious though. Even though this wasn't the correct one, what if that one? What if that would have been your alcohol alkyl group? What's the common name of that of that group? It would be if it didn't have a common name. So this one has a common name. This is on that sheet of, of common names. Isopentyl. <coughs> I'll buy the pentyl. Uh, keep going. Tersh pentyl. I like turf panel. Anybody like where did he pull that from? It's got to be one person going, where did that come from? Right, even though you don't want to raise your hand. But this is where you have to, you have to get over that. You have to say, where did that come from? All right, let's imagine I'm stuck. I'm looking at that going, does that have a common name? And I'm not real big on memorization. So I haven't memorized all of them. Well, which means I haven't learned them, but either way. So I look at this, and this would be named based on the total number of carbons. So how many total number of carbons are there? Five, right? So this is a one, two, three, four, five. This is a pentyl group. I have kind of a hierarchy in my mind. You could flowchart this if necessary. If we flowchart everything, we'll just have nothing but flowcharts. But my first thing is like, is it, it's a pentyl group, okay. Is it a straight chain pentyl group? No, but if it was, it would be called, 
if I had the straight chained pentyl group, it would be called, it could be called pentyl or it could be called n pentyl. Okay. If it had an iso group, does this have an iso group? Well, no, because it has to have a CH3, CH, CH3. And those iso groups normally happen at the other end of the alkyl group. In other words, they happen at the end opposite where my attachment point is. So I look at it, is it straight? Is it straight chain? No. Does it have an iso group? No. Then what's left? What's left is what's the attachment point? of that carbon. Is it secondary or is it tertiary? And in this case, what is it? What kind of carbon is this? Secondary or tertiary? It's tertiary. Because it's got three alkyl groups attached to that carbon. So this would be tertiary. This would be a tertiary pentyl. And then for the pentyls, remember that there's a there's a neopentyl or a new pentyl that somebody came up with that's that. That one is the neopentyl. Okay, so that one We'd look at that, we'd say, okay, it's terse panel. Is there a terse panel? Yes. And so that would be its correct name. For this one on the left, there is no common name for that. So then we go to our IAPAC rules for naming alkyl groups. So that's a 2,2-dimethylbutyl. Okay. Then what's left? What's next? Let's go to the carboxylic acid side. Okay. So basically what I have is I have an ester and an alkene. Which one has the higher priority on the sheet? The ester is the C O O R is the ester. It's just not called an ester. So the C O O R. Does it have a higher priority than the alkene? Yes. So that means we have to number from the end that's the ester end, and we have to include the double bond in the longest chain. Well, that's easy enough. I've got a one, a two, a three, and a four carbon chain. Okay, so that's going to make this a butene, a but, and then my ene part's going to come next, as it has with a lot of problems. But what comes in front of the ene? But, three ene, and then the suffix for the um, ester is 
O A T E. I know it's a, I said an it was an anoate or it was like butanoate last time, but this is a double bond, so it's a butenoate. So this is but three en O eight, telling us that the double bonds between carbons three and four. So that would be the name of the molecule. It would be 2,2-dimethylbutyl, but3-enoate. Any need for cis or trans here? Or E or Z? Yes, no? No, why not? Right. So do I need an E or Z or a cis or trans with that double bonded carbon? Why not? You're shaking your head um, noticeably. Well, because And what else is it bonded to? Two, hydrogen. two hydrogens. First half of your answer was great. I know. I, I get that way myself. So, why is this not cis or trans or E or Z? Yes, but I want a more specific answer than it's on the end. In order for the molecule, in order for the double bond to be cis or trans, what does it have to have attached to the carbons? And you were getting there. You were getting there. You have to have um, a higher priority on each of the sides. Okay, so you have to have a higher priority on each of the sides. What does that mean? Um, so instead of like one of the aqueous, it would have to be. On which carbon? Which carbon does there, there have to be a C instead of an H? Three or four? Four. Okay. So in order for it to be cis or trans, there needs to be one hydrogen and one non-hydrogen group attached to each of the two carbons in the double bond. Right? Have I said that before? I think I have more than once, but apparently it didn't make it on paper. So you need one non-hydrogen group and one hydrogen group on each of the two carbons. Now, do they have to be the same group? So if I have that, so if I have that double bond, and I've got a hydrogen and a non-carbon group, do the non-carbon groups have to be the same group? You said they, you said that they did, but do they really have to be that way? No, you're right. No, they don't have to be the same group. So this group is different than this group. Or they're the same, but they have to be two non-hydrogen groups and then one hydrogen on each of the two carbons. Because 
I would call this what? Is this cis or trans? But everybody should shout that answer out. Cis. How'd you how'd you determine it was cis? Okay. Did anybody use the non hydrogen groups being on the same side to say that it was cis? So it doesn't matter. We get the same answer, right? So that's why there has to be one hydrogen and one hun hydrogen group, because then it doesn't matter if you're looking at the hydrogens or if you're looking at the non hydrogen groups. The minute that I have the minute that I have three non hydrogen groups on the double bond, I can't use this or trans anymore. Because if I here's Anybody want to call that one trans? Well, if you did, then you'd be automatically assuming that you're talking about the two methyl groups. So I'm not necessarily going to know that that's what you're talking about. So once you have three or four non-hydrogen groups, you've got to go easy. Out of curiosity, which one would that be? I heard a Z. Okay, I got an E. How many E's? How many Z's? A lot of hands didn't go up. Let's try it again. Give you, I'll give you a second or two to. Okay. How many people say it's E? Z. All right, more hands. This one. Which of the two groups over here is the high priority? Methyl or ethyl? Ethyl, OH or CH3? OH, they're opposite. That one is E. Okay. So we've got a lot of naming stuff here, but we need to remember what the difference between when we can use cis and trans and when we have to use E or Z. Okay. I mean, we're still a couple weeks away from an exam, but I will almost guarantee you that I will, well, I can guarantee that that's going to be part of it, is naming an, a cis or trans or an E or Z like this, and so we have to remember those rules. So what I should do this weekend that I should put a priority list together. I think some people call these like roadmaps. So if you're, if you're working towards the first exam, here's the things that you need to have in here. And here are the things that you need to, you can use this for. But in order to get to this, there have to be certain things in here. And the first thing is alkyl group names for common names. And then if it's not an alkyl group, do you know how to name the alkyl group using the IEPAC system? And then third, do you know your functional groups? Um, so for um, saying if they're on the same side or the opposite side, can you do it like top to bottom and then left to right? Is that nothing, none of, none of left to right. I didn't hear left to right. Nobody heard left to right. Nobody heard anything about left to right. You basically, in my sister trans, I'm looking at these two, these two against each other, and then those two. So actually, you know what? You heard left to right. I'll reinterpret. So you determine the priority groups between this side and this side, and then it's either cis or it's trans, which means it's either E or it's C. So yes, then you look at all four groups together. Are the two high priority groups opposite? Yes. E, are they the same? C. So that's what you, if that's what you mean by left to right, okay.
but we're always comparing the two groups that are attached to each of the two carbons. This one, this one, now are they same or opposite? On a test, if we did E and Z instead of cis and trans, we did just E and Z? That's okay. But I'm not limited to just E and Z, so you have to be able to, if I use a cis or trans, or the book uses cis or trans, you have to be able to know that. So you can use E or Z exclusively, that's fine with me. Um, but you have to be able to identify cis or trans as well. And I would know the fundamental differences when you can use one or the other. But yes, E or Z is perfectly fine as a substitute for cis or trans. All right. So that was our ester. In the homework? Yeah. Actually, uh, two point six. Which of these is six eight dimethyl bicyclo three two one octane? Okay. Now, if this is truly just a multiple choice question, then I could probably determine I can probably determine the name from just the three, two, one bicyclooctane. But let's just put the skeleton together that way. So I want so I've got a bicyclo three, two, one, and those numbers come in decreasing numeric order octane. So that means, let's see, I've got six numbers and eight carbons, that's okay. So let's put this structure together. Um, one, we've got one bridge, or we've got one carbon attached to the bridges, to the two bridge heads. We've got a two carbon piece, and then we've got a three carbon piece. So I would say the one carbon piece is gonna look like that. The two carbon piece is going to look like that. And the three carbon piece is going to look like one, two, three, like that. Okay, so that would be the first step is to assemble the bicyclic ring. And I better have eight carbons there, right? which I do because the three, two, one is six, and then that doesn't take into account the two bridge heads. So there's my skeletal structure. And then again, if this is, if this is multiple choice, what does that eliminate? Mm, not necessarily D. Because D has a one, two, three, a one, and a two. So D's okay, B's okay, but A, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. A would be a three, three, two. And C would be a two, two, two. Right. So I'm basically down to B and D. Right? Which I guess if you read all your test taking of multiple choices, when you get two structures that look like that, they're probably between the two of them. So if you were pre purely guessing, you would go to B and D. If it's a good test. If it's a bad test, then it would be either A or C because there'd be no, nothing to choose from. Just in terms of multiple choice stuff. Okay. So we all agreed we're at B and D. 
And then I would say it's definitely not B. Because if it was B, this, the dimethyls would have to have the same number. So I could eliminate the B. And so I would say it's D. But that's only if it's a multiple choice question. And if I don't give it to you in multiple choice format, and I said, hey, why don't you draw a 6,8 dimethyl bicyclo 3,2,1 octane, then we'd have to figure out how to do that, right? So we go back to our molecule, and if you remember, the numbering scheme starts at what? Where's what's number one? At a bridge head. So then, so I've got a 6 8 dimethyl, right? So I start numbering at a bridge head. Okay, I'm going to choose that one. Now, which way do I number? Okay, so I'm going around the longest chain, then the next longest chain, then the last chain. So this would be one, two, three, four, and then we go five to the other bridge head. And then we go over to here to six to seven. And then there's always a discontinuity into the last smallest ring. Because you can go round the longest chain directly into the next longest chain, but then the shortest chain is going to have the numbers that aren't in, that aren't continuous. So that would be my numbering scheme. So what do I want to do? I want to put a methyl group here and a methyl group there on six and eight. Um. I could. And you know what I would get? I would get, if I did, well, here, I'll show you. So if I started here and went one, two, three, four, five, and then six and seven, and then eight, I would still have a methyl group on eight, but now the methyl group would be over here on six. So I would get kind of the mirror image of it. Maybe, yes. So if I put those, I just get the mirror image of that structure. But they're both correct. And that one is certainly what, D? That is D. For the exam, I'm probably going to ask you to draw some names from scratch. There may be some names that the more complicated that I might ask you to do a multiple choice. I might give you multiple answers to choose from. Okay. So when we're talking about bicyclos, and it, there's a lot of stuff here, right? And we haven't really gotten into a we haven't done a reaction yet. I mean, they did today's the first day they started to do reactions. And they're reactions that we're going to talk about in detail later. But there's a lot of stuff in it. It all depends on categories. So if we're talking about bicyclos, what do you need to know about them? Well, you need to know what the ring structure is and how, that, how to write the name or get the ring structure from the name. And then how do you number it? And then just putting the substituents on there is fine. Okay. What other stuff do we have? Um, 25.
Which of the molecules would not have an atom that has a 120 degree bond angle? Oh my. Okay, so let's think about what do I need to know about this to answer this question? If we have a 120 degree bond angle, if we have any atom that has a 120 degree bond angle, what hybridization is that? SP2. So if you have a 120 degree bond angle, you're SP2 hybridized. Because you're, what, what is the geometry there? Trigonal planar. So 120 degree bond angle equals trigonal planar equals sp2 hybridized. Okay. Give me a functional group that's sp2 hybridized. No. Isopropyl has that hydrogen, so it's tetrahedral. We draw it like this, but it's got the hydrogen, so it's tetrahedral. So what's flat at 120 degrees? Aldehydes. What else? <coughs> CH3s are tetrahedral. CH3s are tetrahedral because they got another thing oh, attached to them. An amine group. Amines have three bonds with a lone pair. They're tetrahedral. Carboxylic acids. Carboxylic acids. As a matter of fact, anything with a carbon oxygen double bond is tetrahedral. Or sorry. Anything with a carbon oxygen double bond is trigonal planar. Is sp2 hybridized? What else has trigonal planar, it's sp2 hybridized. Any carbonyl, we already took those off the board. Carbon oxygen double bond, carbon what other kind of double bonds do we have? Al Alkenes. Alkenes. So basically anything with double bond is sp2 hybridized, whether it's a carbonyl or whether it's an alkene. Okay. So if I'm looking at this problem, because again we're getting it's like why are we doing this? Because we're trying to answer this problem. The first thing I need to know is I need to know what am I looking for with 120 degree bond angle? Anything that's got a carbon-carbon double bond or a carbon-oxygen double bond. Number one, 2-methylpropene. Does it have anything with 120 degree bond angle in it? Yes or no? Yes, why? It's an alkene. Uh, ethylpropanoate. What's that functional group's name? The O, the A N O A T E. That means you have what functional group? It's an ester. It's what we've been doing all day. Ester. Ester got a carbonyl group? Yes. S 120 degree bond angle? Yes. Uh, three three dimethyl heptanal. What's an al? Aldehyde. Carbonyl. Yes. 120 degree bond angle? Yes. 3 bromobutanamide. Now, this is an amide, which is a C double bond O with a nitrogen attached to the carbonyl. If it was an amine group, no carbonyl. But it's an amide, so it does have a carbonyl. So the answer is yes. Uh, four hexine to all. It's got a triple bond, which is not a 120 degree bond angle. 
a carbon-carbon triple bond is what kind of bond angle? One eighty. OL is alcohol. The alcohol is what kind of bond angle or what kind of geometry? <coughs> Klein, you can leave if you get it right. Alcohol is what kind of what kind of geometry? Just start throwing them out there. I like tetrahedral because I like because the, the lone pairs count. So bent, yeah, that's molecular geometry. Okay, so um, if you had any questions on chapter three, um, I think I'll probably go through and maybe I'll ask you some questions at the start of class, but if you have any questions, um, these I'll put the answer key up for. If you're kind of looking through these going, uh oh, I don't know where to start, then you probably need to come in and ask me a question or two or email me. No. No, but I think we need some drilling. Okay? All right, so I'll see you on Monday. I'm going to study over. Okay, that's fine. Um, did you say that if we got the questions right on the...